And welcome to another episode of the Raw Shock Test Podcast. I am your host, Terrell James. Today, I got a very special guest, very successful guest <laughs> with me, my man, Hussein Abdullah. What's going on, man? How you doing? Peace, brother. What's going on with you? Oh, uh, man, uh, a lot, a lot, man. I've been um, really excited about doing this interview here. Um, I know that you have a lot of a lot of gems, a lot of good information, but I want to, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people want to know about you and you can tell a little bit about yourself, but um, you know, a lot of people probably want to know about the business side, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig into the psychological and the emotional side. So, uh, because I feel like, you know, those things go hand in hand, you know, so much of the psychological and the emotional go into the success. Um, so for people who maybe if this is your first time watching what I do here at the Rorschach test podcast is I put up a series of Rorschach or inkblot tests and I ask my guests what they see. So based off of what they see, I make a psychological and emotional connection to who they are and to what it is that they do for a living. So um, Hussein, can you please just let everybody know exactly who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So I am a retired New York City public school teacher. I retired at the age of 37 after working with the DOE for 14 years. Currently, I make my money in real estate, primarily in coaching and flipping houses. I'm an author. I wrote the book Fear, Forget Everything and Reset. And basically, I'm just the dude just getting through the day, man. We just kind of relax. I'm retired. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much that's pretty much the gist of it. And uh, we're getting ready to drop a podcast, the Busy Money Cast. So, the, you know, the, that show is so is so dope. It's, it's such a it's such an ill concept. I, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, when, when we get to, to the end of the show, I'm going to give you a chance to like plug all of that stuff too, because I want you to let people know exactly where they can get the book and exactly where they can go to find your podcast. You. So, you know, you'll be able to put all of that information out there. Um, and, um, okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get into one of these pictures here. We're going to do the psychology thing now. All right. So we'll start here. Okay, so what did you say you saw here? I I saw a hippo coming out of water. And uh, the reason I said it looked like water is because, like, where would the rest of the face be? But it kind of has that, like, uh, coming out of the, uh, I'm trying to do it on the camera, kind of coming out, um, mm -hmm. something like that. And you see the eyes and you see the ears, see the right. nose. Okay. Okay. So a hippo coming out of water. So a little something about hippos. So hippos spend up to 16 hours in water. And they do that, well, a day, 16 hours a day in water. And they do that to protect their skin from the sun because coming out of the water, that water is a safe space for them. So coming out of that safe space could be potentially dangerous if they're out of it too long, okay? I want to talk about you growing up as a kid in the neighborhood that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. So your home being that safe space. So how dangerous was it for you to leave that safe space? The same way if a hippo left that water for too long, you know, that they would be led into danger. So tell me about you growing up in the neighborhood that you grew up in. How dangerous was it for you to leave your safe space? Oh, I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 80s and the 90s. You know what I'm saying? Say no more. <laughs> I'm not gonna make it like I grew up in like Brownsville, like where Mike Tyson's from. Like I'm not gonna say I grew up in the worst, worst, worst neighborhood in Brooklyn, but mm -hmm. in other states and other cities, mm -hmm. which also have really terrible neighborhoods as well. Right. Most places at that time were not as bad as you know what we grew up in, and um, like just just for example, I lived on the fourth floor of a building, like everybody else in New York, you live in a building. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to go home by myself as early as the age of 10. I had an hour long bus ride by myself to get from school to home. Wow. My mom was putting herself through school and she was a teacher. And uh, something that always, everybody that grew up in Brighton knows my building. What happened is we had like a landing under the stairs. 
Mm-hmm. My lights in the first floor never, ever, ever worked. And there was no windows, so it was always pitch black. The first floor was always pitch black. And it was about as big as, like, um, a, a, a playground, like a, a full court. Mm-hmm. They go on one side or the other side. And I had to walk up those stairs. So many times, prostitutes, junkies, on the steps, you had to step over them. Homeless people, blood on the rails, crack bottles galore. Mm-hmm. I had to go through that every day. And I lived on the top floor, so people lived on this, the landing right there. So mm-hmm. literally, just walking, there's the times I literally open my door and there'd be blood on my door, somebody laying on the floor. Hmm. Like, and that wasn't the worst neighborhood in Brooklyn. Like, people would say my neighborhood was soft, depending on what neighborhood you're talking about. <laughs> you Brooklyn, you lived in the Bronx. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it got, it was real. Mm-hmm. In Brooklyn, for sure. Okay, so. Picking up, well, piggybacking off of that. So the other thing about hippos. So hippos, um, the hippos are one of the few species of animals that can't swim. Despite how much time they spend in water. This is where they spend most of their time. But they actually can't swim, right? Everything around them can swim. Fish, whatever else is in the water, it can, it can swim. So they know how to maneuver through that environment. But the hippo has to find a different way to maneuver through that environment. Everybody else or everything else is moving a certain way. The hippo moves differently. So growing up in this neighborhood, the things that you're accustomed to seeing, your environment, you see hustlers, you see prostitutes, you see the fiends, you see all of these things, right? And because of the environment that that you're growing up in or because of the neighborhood, all of these things, it's conducive to being in this neighborhood. And it's easy to move that way. But you move differently. You didn't move in the same manner. So what was it for you that said, you know what, I'm going to move differently than everybody around me? As an adult, being able to look back and reflect, I know it was the core crew of people around me. Like I just said, I had to travel to school for an hour. My school district, I think that school district was 21. I went to District 15. Like, mm-hmm. My mom worked in a good school district. She made sure we got into schools in the good school district by like my grandmother's house. Okay. So like, she took me out of that environment. You know what I'm saying? Like most of the high schools in they, they, they have such low ratings. So she took me out of that environment in that way. My brother, you know, ended up back in that school district because he was, you know, getting in trouble and whatnot. So he kind of was around. And my pops known him was kind of like from that area a little, a little something so the, i, I kind of was able to avoid certain things because of the reputations of the people that was around me mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so I, I really didn't have to to deal with certain things and then it was like ingrained in me so i didn't make certain choices you know what i'm saying so like if 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 my brother somebody i look up to and my brother was a barber he would cut hair in my house and and he'd be like, yo, you know, this person, this, that, 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 like, stay away from that person, don't do this. If he's the person saying, yo, the weed is corny, the drinking is corny, even though he did it, but I didn't know. <laughs> what, what else would I think to do? So, like, psychologically, like, he brainwashed me, which right. is cool because he was young and he knew enough to be like, yo, you see that? Yo, that dude's a bomb. Yo, this dude's mad corny. You see? Yo, man, this dude's just corny. And so I, I, I couldn't see it any other way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That that makes that makes a lot of sense, man. You're talking about big brothers. You know, you, you see guys, they always look up to their big brothers. And they want to be like their big brothers. They want to wear their clothes. They want to listen to the same music. They want to stay out as late as the big brother is allowed to stay out, you know. But it's, it's good to have a brother who even in the midst of doing the things that he's doing, it's a do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> you yeah. know? So, you know, you, you can appreciate that. And, you know, I, you know, in a lot of instances, you know, some people will look up to that big brother and say, you're a hypocrite. You're telling me not to do it, but you're doing it. But then, then there's the other case like you, where you see it, you receive it. You're like, got you. And, and it kept you on the right course. So that's good. That's good. And I commend you for that because that I'm sure that's difficult. You know, that it's a difficult decision, especially when 
that lifestyle looks cool. Yeah. And that life is alluring, <laughs> you know. Thousand percent. <laughs> thousand. But you know, like you said, like there's other ways to operate. Right. So, you know, I did my things in other ways, and like I seen how my brother moved, and my brother looked better than most of the dudes I was on the street. Mm -hmm. And that was just like being a barber, you know what I'm saying, and and doing that type of thing. Um, so I did my little things that I did, and um, was able to avoid that. You know what I'm saying, and then also. You're in such command when you cut ahead, you know what I'm saying? Like people come mm -hmm. from, you, you kinda got the drop on everybody. So you kinda get get the opportunity to say, Oh, I wanna mess with this, I don't wanna mess with that. Oh damn it. That person did that. Oh, let me stay away from that person's snake. Like people mm -hmm. tell you all the stuff like therapists, you know what I'm saying? Like you hear everybody. Yeah. So you <laughs> as long as you observe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was a gem. I said, Bing, got a gem. <laughs> 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 Boy, timing is everything. <laughs> oh, okay, man. Well, let's let's move on to another one of these pictures. So, what did you say you saw here? <laughs> Some of you can't unsee it. If you, if you look in the middle and you see like the head and like the nose and like the chin, I kept seeing Peter Griffin. <laughs> Peter Griffin like looking at himself and like. A tropical island, and in the back, it looks like there's like the, um like palm trees, and it looks like somebody's like cutting something, you know what I'm saying? And like the fruits falling because there's like the one little dot. So I thought it was like not that I thought it was an episode of like Family Guy, but like <laughs> I unsee Peter Griffin's silhouette, and it messed <laughs> up, and I couldn't stop laughing. So yeah, good for sure. Okay, so <laughs> so we're gonna start with Peter Griffin, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so Peter Griffin, by cartoon standards, has a pretty hot wife, right? <laughs> and then he has this son who is a complete idiot. <laughs> he has a daughter who is awkward and a dork. Yeah. He has another son, a baby that it's a talking baby, and we still I can't figure out if they can hear. I don't know if only Brian the dog can hear Stewie or if everybody can hear him. I can't figure it out yet. Right. I know for a fact that Brian can, but it doesn't seem like they're always responding to him, you know, as if they heard him verbally. So I don't know. But you have a talking baby right. who is probably. Uh, who probably has anger issues and will one day take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a group of friends. You have one gigolo. <laughs> you got one cop who's in a wheelchair. And you have a black man. Right. I want to talk about variety. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to talk about variety. I want to talk about being well-rounded. How diverse is your circle? Now, I don't mean just culturally. I mean in the way they think, uh, culturally also, but but also in the way they think, the way they um, pursue business decisions, the way they deal with um, their families. E even you know, are they good people to their family? Are they good people to their friends? You know, or do you have some that are good, some that are bad? You know, but just the diversity. How how diverse is your circle? I think it's. If you go culturally, forget about it. I grew up in Brooklyn. Right. Okay. My name is Hussein Abdullah, right, which is associated with one thing. Right. And my mom is from the South, from Alabama. So, like, I'm black. Like, I'm black, black. <laughs> I'm not as black as it gets. Like, I'm black, black. You're my right. mom is Puerto Rican. So, mm -hmm. Puerto Rican, black, Muslim dude. Like, that's just say everything you need to know. That's the mixture of Brooklyn. Right there. Okay. So, culturally, forget about it. Now, in terms of, I guess you would say, uh, not not personality types because there's a range there, but in terms of let's say like ethics and uh, morality and whatnot, yo, know, there's not that wide of a range. <clears throat> everybody I deal with, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody that I'm really tough with, like really close with, is old school. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the same set of morality. You know, which a lot of dudes, you know, people say like, oh, people nowadays don't have it. People didn't have it back then. We move a certain way. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
it's very it's very hard to get it inside of like that circle of trust like you know with your parents like right there's not much diversity there everybody does what they're supposed to do for their kids mm-hmm. everybody looks at business a certain way everybody looks at handling things a certain way and and that's male or female so yeah there's not much diversity in terms of um how people move okay yeah I, I had a feeling that was going to be your answer because you know birds of a feather um you know just based off of your level of success and um just the way that you go after business um the, the manner in which you do it i wouldn't see you hanging with a group of people who didn't have that same type of drive that same type of mentality um so um but i think that it's important for other people who are on their path to success to understand that and to hear that from somebody who is extremely successful everybody can't go with you yeah and i thank you thank you for that yeah and, that, and that's mm-hmm. a fact. i think that um there's there's like a there's a there's a thing where like a lot of young dudes now you know they'll end up getting robbed or shot or killed or they end up committing a crime Mm-hmm. because they have an attachment to the hood right and when i was younger i had an attachment to my hood you know i wouldn't even call it a hood, my neighborhood okay. you know what I'm saying? like because i had the opportunity to leave while i was sent away and then i was able to experience something different and then i was able to come back so i had something to compare it to mm-hmm. because a lot of people don't get the opportunity to choose between two things most people never leave their city they never leave their neighborhood so then when I start to move differently, I'm like, yo, we should, we could do this. We could do that. And dudes had that Brooklyn mentality. So then it's like, oh, you act different, you move different in this life. I'm around 30 and 40 year olds. Mm-hmm. Like, why would I want to chill on a corner when I'm hanging around with people that are buying houses? Right. Why would I want to buy Jordans when I got people that are buying boats? Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, so yeah. It, I kind of like trimmed, you know, pruned some of the um, people that just, like you said, they, they kind of, they couldn't come along. And I don't feel weird. Like I, I was just in my neighborhood the other day, so it's not like I can't go back. But it's not, like if it was bad, I wouldn't go back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, to prove how tough you are. Like, I could go anywhere. I'm going to wear all my chains, and I better not get robbed. And then you're a headline, like, right. You don't have to be tough. I have money. I'm not trying to prove how tough I am. I'm trying to enjoy this money. <laughs> exactly. But you can't go. I'm happy for that. I don't want to see people like you. I, hey, who's that? Mm-hmm. How did he get a ticket? No, you can't be over here. No, I want right. to enjoy things, man. I ain't trying to be tough, man. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Anybody that's been through stuff knows that that's not what you're supposed to glorify. Right. I'm, I'm good. I'm happy with being happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and safe. Yeah, like why would you want? Why would you want to be like, yo? I'm gonna be on the worst block to prove that I could be on the worst block. Like that, that, that never. And I can't say never because you know when you're young, you try to go and do things, and you, I'm gonna go to this hood. Nobody can't, and then you catch what you was looking for, and then it's like, oh wait, maybe I shouldn't be over here. You know, I don't know to be over here. Like I shouldn't be over here. So, you know, for a lot of young people watching, I just. Man, you don't gotta prove that you're tough. Mm-hmm. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Like if something happens, you may defend yourself. You do what you gotta do. That's mm-hmm. different. I'm not right. saying be a sucker or be a chump. I'm just saying don't go looking for nonsense because it's t- it's very easy to avoid most situations if you uh, humble yourself and let go of your ego. Right. Yeah. And stop bringing food around wolves. And post oh. it and show it. It's- yeah yeah you can't like i don't i don't understand the mentality man and you know trying to you know like you say trying to prove that you're tough to a bunch of people because then what then what like what what comes with that so now you got people that are going to make you stand behind that that you you're going to have to prove that that's who you are and if you prove it and you're successful now what (laughs) you know this is going to lead to a bunch of now what's until it leads to a dead end right so i don't know hopefully hopefully that mentality changes i hope i pray it does you know but you know time will tell time will tell yeah so okay all right the same picture what was the other thing that you said that you saw here 
at first, it kind of looked like a pregnant woman. Like, it oh. just, because the, middle, because the middle looks like a bump, like a big belly. And, and the back off top looked mm -hmm. tropical to me. Like, it, it, everything in, it, in the top looked tropical, you know what I'm saying? So, okay. it, it, I was like, is it like a pregnant woman on a, um like on an island? And then I seen the Petey Griffin silhouette, and then I, I lost it. Okay, and you, you said something about cutting fruit from trees too, something like yeah. that. Yeah, if you see the dot, mm -hmm. like there's a dot, and and then the top part looks like a palm tree. Mm -hmm. And and the, the dude in the back looks like he's holding like a like a sword or like a machete, unless it's like a ninja, you know. But it, it, to me, that <laughs> one dot made it look like they cut fruit from a tree, like it's like a tropical scene. Okay, so cutting fruit from a tree. Um, I um I you know I completely to be honest which I completely forgot about the pregnant woman and trying to link that, so I I skipped over that one. But the um but the the cutting the fruit from the tree. So I want to talk about low hanging fruit. So when but I want to go back to your twenties though because this is a very important time for young men. Okay, and a lot of times you know we are so full of testosterone we just like just ready to just pounce and not just on women but you know but anything we just kind of like in overdrive when it comes to a lot of things right which also means that for a lot of us we take advantage of the low-hanging fruit so i want to ask you for you in your 20s did you go after low-hanging fruit and this could be anything this could be women this could be opportunities whatever it doesn't matter were you the type to go after low-hanging fruit if you were, what was it emotionally that made you decide to go after it? Now, if you didn't go after it, same question. What emotionally made you say, this is too easy. I'm not going for this low hanging fruit. Yeah, I, I can answer that in a couple of ways. So like you mentioned women, right? And you know, there's, there's a chapter in the book, right? Where we talk about, um, I, uh, the, the words escaping me right now, but we'll say for right now, like morality. Okay. All right. The chapter's called dignity, right? So right. Talk about dignity. Um, no, I don't. I don't personally. Maybe like in junior high school, you know, you play like you know, truth to dare, or whatever. You know, you <laughs> end up kissing a lot of girls. Oh, there's a girl even. I don't want to kiss her. Like, you know what I mean? Come on, like what? Do I dare me? Like I hate you guys. But I, no, <laughs> I, I personally don't feel like in terms of like relationships that I would deal with a with a woman just because like let's say she was like easy to deal with mm -hmm. or a young lady because she was easy to deal with. I always thought that was kind of corny. Like I hate those dudes like you know like you walk down the street and dudes break their neck or they sure they ain't. I never I feel like I never was that type. Mm -hmm. I, I really never was like um some people would say like because when you have something like you don't have to like put on airs. Right. You know? Man, like you ever see like <clears throat> usually the thirsty dude in the club is a dude that never talked to a woman. So they don't right. have to act. Or they like so uh, 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 uh. like I always felt like I was always popular. We'll say it like that. Mm -hmm. So attention is not new to me. Right. So then I get to delineate and discern who I want my attention to go to or who who I want to try to get their attention. Usually it's like the the, the um, thrill of the hunt for me. Mm -hmm. Um in terms of making money um maybe you know maybe like because you know we didn't have money so it, maybe it makes sense that i might have gone for opportunities that were easier even though i don't feel like they were easier mm -hmm. um i i took the um the i didn't take the beaten path right so like when i was younger i would like sell doubles of cards like you know to collect comic books or whatever so i had mm -hmm. my collection i don't have a use for these I can make money to get more of what I want. Uh, when I graduated to clothes, it was like, yo, I got these shirts. I'm not gonna wear this. Let me sell that. My man got this. Let me, you know what I'm saying? I bought these sneakers just because they came out and I didn't like them. Let me trade them or do something. You know, so I don't I don't know if that was easier, but it just made sense to me to right. do it. You know, so um, I could tell you what, I could tell you now I'm not a low hanging fruit type of dude because who retires from a job that has quote unquote summers off, six hour days, full pension, full benefits. Like who would walk away from that? Like right. to work and do 
you know, the hours that, that I used to put in, you know, like, I don't know. I, I, so I, I just think I'm a math person, right? Like I, uh, I didn't say it earlier, I taught math, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I like problem solving, I always have. Um, and and in, in psychology, I forget the name of the matrix, but basically it's like, if you have a uh, high intelligence and you have a menial task, you get bored. But if you have a uh, low intelligence, you have a menial task, you're happy. But if you have low intelligence and a hard task, you hate it because of frustration. And if you have high intelligence and um, a high task, you're engaged. Okay. So I get bored with things quick. Even back in the days when I used to deal with women, you know, I'm married now, you know what I'm saying? But there was a boredom that used to come with that. That's why for a good amount of time I was single. I just okay. pick things up and put things down. And it seems terrible to say it like that around relationships, but... Mm-hmm. You're gonna be honest, you know. I was younger too, so you learned a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I feel like your twenties, late teens, that's the time to pick stuff up and put stuff down. <laughs> like it's, you know, you're going through it. There's a learning. There's a learning process that you have to go through. Um, you know, the the best way to do it is by being completely honest with everybody that you're dealing with. We're not always honest. I haven't always been honest, you know, when I was younger, you know, but I mean, but that is the best way to do it. You know, you have to figure out what it is that you want. Right. Figure out what it is that you're willing to deal with for the rest of your life. Right. How do you, if you don't experience something. Exactly. And that, and that's, you know, I try to, I coach a lot of my young, I work with a lot of soldiers and I, and I volunteer in high schools and, you know, and I'm like, listen, man, good looking young dude. Don't lie to these girls. Don't mm-hmm. ever tell a girl you love her if you don't love her. Right. I, and I never did that in school. Like that's like cardinal. So like that's terrible to mm-hmm. do that with somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, and stay single because you know you can enjoy. You know why would you want to to have somebody like where you at? Why you can't talk to the? You haven't even got to explore anything yet, and you are already in confinement. So mm-hmm. uh, I think young people should not that you should like have sex. I'm just saying like you should be able to interact and have fun. With as many, you know, as teens and whatnot, I, I agree to a thousand percent. You know, experience is, is usually the best teacher because sometimes somebody else's experience is a better teacher. You don't have to go through everything, you know, exactly. that's, that's wisdom. But you know, 18, there's no wisdom, doesn't I don't think you could be wise at 18. I haven't really seen it on a broad, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. you know. Yeah, that, that's actually one of my, my wisdom teachings because I'm, um, I don't know if I told you this, but I'm also a life coach. And um, so so one of my my teachings when it comes to wisdom is, um, you know, the the ways, the various ways that you develop the wisdom or that you acquire the wisdom. You know, sometimes you have to go through it. Sometimes you just sit back and you observe and you watch other people and you learn from them, you know. So. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, I believe that some 18 year olds may have some wisdom, but. That wisdom is for the 15 year olds, <laughs> for the ones that, that's younger than them, you right. know. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, because the thing is, you know, you grow and and as you as you live and experience more, your thinking changes. So I don't think the same way I thought five years ago. The 18 year old doesn't think the way the 15 year old thinks. Right. Thankfully, because I know some 40 year olds that think like 18 year olds. Yeah, me yeah. too. <laughs> no, and that's the thing, you know, it there's some people that I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to try to diagnose it, but you see certain people. And um, again, since we're talking about psychology, uh, maybe if we want to just kind of, you know, go, go that way a little bit, it, I think it, it could be purposefully, right? Mm-hmm. If there's some statistic, I hate to misquote them, but it's something like you see either 10,000 or 20,000 advertisements in any given day. Hmm. Right, so like even like in this shot, you got one logo, you got another logo, you got another logo, you got five logos, you got another logo here. You have your logo on one. There's a logo up top. Just in this one shot, there's ten logos, and then every right. time it goes by in the bottom, that's an advertisement. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, so just so you could see like where, where you know any logos you have on your clothes. So, uh, developmental psychology or behavioral psychology is relatively new science, if you want to call it a science. But they've mastered it quite quickly. 
so you know if you show people right like angry images and then you ask them questions they're going to tend to be angry you show people right. angry images yeah so is it really is it really shocking that people who um you know spend good amounts of time on facebook and instagram where it's ads galore mm -hmm. um want to buy luxury items or they want to be on vacation or they want to dress a certain way or they want to act a certain way like and you know it's i think i think people are caught up and i think it's i mean it's by design you know i, I struggle with some of that sometimes uh late at night and you be bored and like nothing else to do and you're like let me just see and then ads come up and you're like i'm gonna buy this i'm, I'm gonna buy this right you have to give yourself 10 minutes to be like, I didn't even want, I didn't even want that. Like, why, <laughs> look at that. why is it on my phone? And it, but it's hard to do. It, it takes a yeah. discipline to um, be able to say no to something that's going to uh, release dopamine. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know. Yeah, it is. It definitely is, man. That damn dopamine to get you in trouble every time. Yeah. It's a reason that it starts with the word dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right man so the next picture here what did you say you saw here I, if if is there a way that you could like rotate it 180 degrees or turn it upside down did i put the wrong one up there no, no, you put the right one up but i didn't see anything when i looked at that uh-huh so oh well so yes and no i can't turn it upside down but i can't do it right now because there's a reason that i can't do it and i'll get to that in a few <laughs> so, <laughs> so but i i really didn't see anything looking at this okay um you know and i tried to I, all three i tried to be honest Mm -hmm. I was like, I, no, because this was fun. It was exciting. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried not to say, well, I, I know if I say this, he could read it. I really tried not to, to think into that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like rotated it because, you know, there's no rule that says you can't, right? It's a rush. I can look at any angle direction you want. Okay. And to me. Um, oh, so you, so you turned it upside down and then looked at it. Yeah. You did. Okay. I'll tell you what. In that case, I will go go here then. All right. So now it's like totally clear. So okay. if you look in the center, it looks like a like a lion's nose mm -hmm. coming down and like eyes, and it almost looks like a smile, like a joker smile, like. Uh huh. But the two square type shapes in the bottom. Okay. Kind of reminded me of like a jack o' lantern. So like if it, if you look at the way it's all cut out, it looks like I said a stylized version of a lion cut out like a jack o -lantern. like if somebody tried to make a lion out of out of a pumpkin something like that so that's what i saw a mixture of those two things okay so now we're, we're going to still come back to that picture in a, in a bit even though we turned it upside down but um all right so you said a stylized jack-o-lantern of a lion okay so what i want to do here is i want to take three parts of this i want to break this up into three parts we're going to start with style you said stylized then we're going to go into the jack-o-lantern and then we'll go into the lion okay so first i want to start with style so um in reading your book um which of course you know i haven't read the entire thing yet i'm probably right around halfway through but um one of the things that i picked up on uh was the way that you dressed back then you know back back in the, in the 90s you know and uh your style was very similar to the style of the drug dealers yeah. now the drug dealers they were out there flipping pies flipping birds you flip houses so going back to style that word style how much of your style did you get from the hustlers and i mean by just watching and observing them as businessmen and women not necessarily selling drugs but as far as handling business how much of your style did you get from them if you're talking about style in terms of physical appearance, I'll break it into two pieces. Like, 
I'm a hip like I'm a hip hop dude. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, I'm gonna emulate what I see on TV and what I see is cool and also how my brother dressed. Mm-hmm. And it also the time, like early, early nineties, mid nineties is like my prime, like high school, whatnot, right? Like in terms of like being young. So that's all like Wu Tang, Biggie, beginning Jay Z, whatnot. So yeah, of course I'm gonna like Rock Lauren. Like polo's gotta be the thing. If you're from mm-hmm. that, that, that's what you did. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, Jordans was a thing. Like you can see right here, I got these Nikes, never worn. Those are from 1990. Or oh, these predated phone posits. You know, there's a story behind those. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, so like sneaker culture and whatnot, it was a thing because it was that was about being unique and wearing something like nobody else could attain. That really was about money. But it was also like nobody would have the same thing as you. So in terms of style, I always wanted to be different because I always wanted to be able to express myself. Um, in terms of how people moved, I always paid attention to um, people that were really getting it in a certain way. And what I noticed, even at a young age, and this is also in the book, that the people that were really moving on a high, high level didn't look like it. Because that's how you get hot, right? right? If you pull up on a corner and someone has on, you know, two or three chains, loud color clothes, rims on their car, they could be a pharmacist. They're going to get a certain type of attention. And if right. the dude is walking by in construction clothes, nobody, he's, he looks like the hard worker. Meanwhile, the dudes that was really getting it was low key because they had, you know, Wild houses, or they knew what they had in the stash, or they had already been in trouble, so they knew to stay low if they were going to stay in, the, in whatever game they were playing. So I think in terms of style, I learned that you know, say less. Got you. Mm-hmm. I still move like that. You know what I'm saying? People ask me all the time, and if they watch this, then they'll know not to ask me. Yo, how many houses do you own? And I'll be like, why? Mm-hmm. Like, why? Well, I said, I don't count. I, I really don't know, but like, like, I don't understand what, like, so if I say a certain number, you're gonna wanna do business with me? If I, yeah, <laughs> I don't understand why you're asking this question. Or then the follow-up question that is, are you a millionaire? And then depending on who I'm talking to, I'll be like, well, not since my 20s. You know what I'm saying? Who so I'll be like, you know, nah, cause I'm multi, you know, like, you know, millions, not a lot. Like, so it depends on, on the, person how they asking you like because I never understand that like right if I what you're doing I don't understand why money has to be a part of the conversation like if you're good at what you're doing I want to be around you because you're good at that thing mm-hmm. so, yeah. I, think, I think for a lot of people the ones who don't know what it's like to be in your position there is this um you know that they want it it's something that, that they want to to do with something that they want to attain but then there is the i wonder what it's like you know there are these questions you know they these thoughts these wonders you know what is it like to be a multimillionaire? what is it like to own a bunch of different homes and to be able to travel and go wherever you want to go um and then i also think now there's something behind it there's something else that's going to be coming. It's like, okay, now, how do you put me, how do you put me in a position to do these same things right. instead of them trying to put in the work? Right. And and I think, and that's true. And if, if you look at like my social media, I share my clients' successes. Mm-hmm. I share their checks. I share their properties. I share their stories because that's what should matter. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you was able to be around like LeBron or Michael Jordan or Steph Curry or anybody that was like, you know, elite, you you can't be them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you you have to want to know what they could do for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I, I do agree that there is, there's an allure and um, I think, again, it's uh, one of the books I read really young was uh, The Millionaire Mindset. And it was ill. I'm not a reader, even though I've read you know, certain books, but I'm not a reader. I, I wouldn't call myself a reader. 
um, I walk into Barnes and Nobles. I just, had just came back to New York, and um, I was like, "Man, I need to like, I need to, I need to do something." I walk into a Barnes and Nobles, and I bought two books that changed my life, but altered it. The Millionaire Mindset, and I, I, I mean, I had no idea what I was in there for. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, the book just jumped out to me. Millionaire Mindset in a book called OPM, Other People's Money. That's out of the Robert Kiyosaki, or Robert Kiyosaki's doing a Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm-hmm. It's the, the cover is purple, black, and gold, just like it's in the Rich Dad series. Mm-hmm. I had a Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I said, oh, okay, the same guys? Okay, let me get OPM, and let me get the Millionaire Mindset. And um, in the Millionaire Mindset, they chronicle uh, a wide group of millionaires over, uh, they did a longitudinal study, right, over 10 years. And they track how they spend, how they <clears throat> how they went on vacation, how they bought furniture, how they bought ha- houses, cars, me, everything. And um, for anybody who's like, you know, what is it like to be like a multi-millionaire? What is it like to not have to go to work? You know, because I do put in work, but I don't, like, I don't have to. Nobody dictates my schedule. Right. It's the same. <laughs> if you're a miserable person and you have some money, you're gonna be a miserable person. If you're a happy person. And you have some money, you're going to be happy. Um, you know, I don't think money changes you. I think money amplifies who you truly are. Right. I, and agree. I, want, to, I want to do nothing. You know what I'm saying? I, w- I don't want to do anything all day. So I don't. I hang out in sweatsuits. I chill with my wife. I hang out with you know, my daughter. I hang out with my nephews, my nieces, the kids. Like, I just chill. So I put myself in a situation and, and in a business that allowed me the freedom to do that as much as I wanted to. So, you know, had fancy cars, you know, I still, I still do, I still like jewelry. So I still have some, you know, some nice pieces, but none of that really brings you happiness. It, right. it really doesn't. It, um, it actually could put you in a bad spot because if you're in a certain type of car, you know, then it's kind of like the thing that, you know, if you have a certain type of clothes, then you have a certain type of watch. You have a certain type of watch, a certain type of clothes, and a certain type of car. You gotta have a certain type of house. So then, like, you end up in this like endless cycle of trying to portray what you should look like. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After a while of doing that, it's like I don't have to do that. Why am I thinking about other people so much? Right. It's like you're trying to keep up with yourself. <laughs> yeah. And it becomes a vicious cycle. And um, yeah. and when that in high school, and like again, there's ton, there's people on my page that follow from high school, and they, they put comments on the pictures, like, "Yo, he's not lying. He's been doing this since junior high school. He's been doing this since high school. Like, he's not lying. I'm, this is what it is." Mm-hmm. So I think, like Jordans now come out like every week because there's so many retros. Before there were retros, when he was still playing. They only release two or three pair a year, like different kind of preseason, playoff, postseason. I mean, regular season. That's it. Maybe a summer pair of off brand when he became his own brand. So there, there was no aftermarket. There was no eBay. There was there was no lines. You either just were gonna get them or you weren't. And they were really expensive, so most people weren't buying. And I would get every pair. Everybody says that, but I have pictures. Like I would get sneakers that I didn't even like just so I could go to school to say I had them. Mm-hmm. And then like they dry rotted. Like I have still a ton of sneakers. It, and it's like, why was I doing that? You know what I'm saying? So I was able to learn that from a young age. So I don't do it now. I think some people never had the opportunity to do that. Um, and you got to get it out your system. But I can tell you from experience, man, you should just do the stuff you like. Be as happy as much as you want, and I think you live a better life. Trying to uh, live up to other people's expectations or to put on airs, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of energy, it doesn't benefit you. I right. think you just do the stuff you like. If you really like sneakers, be a sneakerhead, but don't do it because it's the thing to do. Do it because it's what you love. Right, right. yep. So, okay. I had um I was trying to remember the the last question that I had asked you. We we start talking about style and we we veered off and then we came back and we ended with style. So like, <laughs> okay um the um the other thing hold on I'm gonna put this picture back up. Okay so the other thing you said a jack o' lantern okay so 
the jack-o'-lantern is something associated with Halloween. Halloween is something that is associated with fear uh, because, you know, a bunch of scary things going on around Halloween, right? So I want to talk about fear. Now, you have a book, Forget Everything and Reset, right here, fear being the acronym. So, but I want to talk about what fear meant to you as it pertains to real estate. When you got involved in real estate, what were the fears that you had going into this business? There's a saying, and I don't want to misquote it, but you know, I'll send it to you so you can have it. But basically, something like smart people. Basically, it's smart people are, are too smart to to make business decisions, and dumb people. Like, smart people are unsuccessful, and dumb people are successful. And what that means is. There's something called analysis paralysis, mm -hmm. where some people overanalyze things and they'll find all the reasons not to do something so they never make a move because they're scared of risk. I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I just was like, y'all want to try this. I've always been like that. Gotcha. I didn't want to go in the water, anything. Like, even sometimes I have, let's, let's see. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't know enough to, to be afraid. Okay. You know, my first deal was with a partner. You know what I'm saying? So he had a couple joints. So I was like, well, he's not going to he's not gonna lose his money. So if I put my money with him, I should make money too. Right. So honestly, I didn't have any apprehensions. Any, I didn't know any better. Okay. And that actually is going to lead me to, to my next question. So um, the, the other thing you said you saw here was a lion, the lion's face. So lions from a distance so lions are beautiful majestic animals from a distance because up close <laughs> that same beautiful majestic animal is terrifying um there are so many things that would happen to run through your mind if you were face to face with a lion um how did i end up in this situation uh the unknown the unpredictability of the situation is this going to kill me? Is this going to be too much for me? These are also some questions that people have when it comes to success. For a lot of people, they see success in the distance and it's beautiful and it's majestic. But as soon as it's in front of them, fear sets in. They start to get scared. There is the fear, the unpredictability. How did I get myself into this? Is this going to kill me? You know, there are these questions when it comes to, um, to success. Um, so for you because there's some people that are afraid of success there's a lot that comes with it there is a lot of weight that comes with it there's a lot of responsibility that comes with success and some people are afraid of that now for you you have already i had this question prepared in a different way but you've already you've already answered it what i initially was going to ask you was um when you were faced with that lion and I mean success here, when you were faced with that lion, did fear set in or were you able to just forget everything and reset? You've already answered that question because you clearly forgot everything and you reset. So now my question is, how did you forget everything when it was faced, when we were face to face with it and you had to make that decision? How did you just forget everything and reset? So there's two things. I, I, I answer the question first, and then I want to go back to uh, my definition of success. For me, and I still do this now, and this is something I think that, that is a good tip for business people at all levels. Whenever I'm put in like a precarious situation, I live like I literally like I'm old school, pen and paper. I make a list. I make my pros, mm -hmm. and my cons. And we're human, so we tend to focus on the negative more. So if I have 10 good things and three bad things, it seems like the three bad things outweigh the, the good for some reason. It just seems like right. that. Mm -hmm. But I always look at the worst case scenario of everything. When I'm buying a property, uh, well, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? And if that thing won't hurt me, then there's no reason not to jump in. Right. Because we know 85% of the time, you know, there's a number of people throw out 
that what you think is going to happen is not going to happen. It's usually something totally different. And it's usually positive or, or, or less negative than you perceive. Mm-hmm. So I know that through life experience. Like, there's been so many times that I had, like, near-death experiences. There's so many times that, like, I should have definitely, you know, and I think a lot of us could attest to that. Like, you know, there's no way I was supposed to get out of that situation. And, like, <laughs> right. I my pain and I dunked through the thing. It was crazy. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I'm a big believer in energy. And and I believe that I always try to be righteous about situations. I always try to give people the uh, benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. I always try to give people extra opportunities, even in business. Um, I, I never try to take like the lion's share. I always try to make sure we're all in a winning position. So... And I don't have any fear. Like, I, uh, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. So if something negative happens, like, you know, some people, she talks to some people and they're like, man, today's been good. This week's been really good. I know something bad's about to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, why would you even? Like, why is that even? Like, so, it's, so it's a mindset. Right. I feel like I deserve the good things because mm-hmm. I, I make people's days perfect. Like I don't do it for the best thing, I do it because it's the thing to do, right? Like it's piety pious or pious pie, like you know, like chicken and the egg, like nah, but I'm gonna start doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um so there's that. And then to go back to uh the definition of success, I think everything that you deal with is a mindset. And I do know I've been fortunate to be put in situations where people, you know, put stuff in my mind and I was able to digest it or look at it a certain way. But um to me, I think success isn't a destination. I think success is a journey, right? Yes. So I listened to Earl Nightingale and, um, you know, YouTube, somehow, you know, he was brought into my world. And so Earl Nightingale says, basically, whenever you have a goal and you're doing something to achieve that goal, you're successful because you're on the path. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not an end, it's not an end, end game. It's, like, all right, well, um, we're doing this podcast, you know, we're working on this. We're, as long as you can look and say, like, I did something productive today or something fulfilling today, you're successful because you're happy because you're doing something that's making your, your time on this planet worthwhile. So every day, every day, I try to do five or six things to make sure when the night ends, I didn't waste the day because, you know, these things are not guaranteed. Right. Mm-hmm. That sounds that sounds good, man. And that's that's great advice coming from somebody that is um, as successful as you are. Um, there have been a lot of gems, a lot of gems here, and I hope people are picking up on these gems. Um, it's uh, um, be, becoming successful. It's not just about making money. Um, it's about opportunities. It's about the opportunities that you can create for other people. Um, and also, I think one of the biggest lessons, one of the biggest things that I've heard you say, you didn't say it like this verbatim, but what I heard loud and clear is money does not make you happy. <laughs> money gives you security, but money does not make you happy. So do the things that make you happy and you will always be wealthy. <laughs> right. right. What's the point of having all the money in the world if nobody likes you? What's the point of having all the money in the world? Your casket drops, nobody comes out. Mm-hmm. Wow, right? Like, and people could say, like, that's the thing. Like, some people say, like, well, you could say that because you're in a certain position. And I'm like, that that might be true. Being humble about it, that might be true. Like, it's easy for somebody who has a car to say, well, yeah, it's only an A to B car. But the person on the bus is like, man, I would kill to get that A to B car. <laughs> But um, but then they also don't know the maintenance, the headaches that come along with it. Like, mm-hmm. so um, I, I I really I, I I'm a firm believer in just be happy, man. Mm-hmm. Just be happy. Yeah, and absolutely. Do, do things that it, this is a this is a little a little check. This is a, this is a little trick or a little test for anybody out there that's that's gonna see this. Because a lot of these things come down to um, tangible items, right? Homes, cars, now we have Instagram so people can see your vacations. 
if nobody could see what you purchased, if nobody could see the car you drive, if nobody, if you couldn't show pictures of, you know, the inside of your house or the outside or whatever, if nobody could see what you're doing, would you still do it? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good test. You know, there's a lot of times, man, I'd be like, man, this is not a good idea. I should not pay for this. It's not <laughs> right. Let me just put the phone. But it, it took time to get to that uh, level of discipline. But that mm -hmm. people who are trying to get to another level and they don't have the money, look at where your money is going. Usually it's for something that's like a short term fulfillment to make you feel better about your real situation. Mm -hmm. You can say, like, hey, I'm going to buy this bag because I want to feel good and I want to go to work. And then the lady at my job, I don't like, I want her to see that I got this nice bag. And it's like, is she even thinking about you? Like it's 12 o'clock at night, she's like, no more family. Like, right. nobody's thinking about you. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. you know, if you have some humility and realize that nobody really cares about what you're doing, what you have, mm -hmm. you a lot further ahead. <laughs> I just think that, I, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think about people that much. And I got that from my brother, like real talk. Mm -hmm. I give credit where it's due. When yeah. I was married, I was like, yo, I want to come back. I want people to, I want to pull up. And he was like, yo, if you retire and you're still thinking about this job and you're still thinking about these people and you don't have to see them, there's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. He was like, the real flex is that you have success and then they see you winning but you don't even know it because you're so busy winning, right? Like the thing, like the winner focuses on winning, the loser focuses on a winner. Right. And it's in the Bible too, you know, so there's all these different references from all over the world. Like you should, I mean, I'm focused on one thing. I'm focused on happiness. I'm focused mm -hmm. on that. every day, that's it. Right. That's mm -hmm. it, I can't care about nothing else. Right, yep. Because that's where true fulfillment lies, so. Okay, man. Well, look, we're going to move on to the next part of the show. This part is called Flip the Script. So this is why I was saying what I was talking about with the picture. So what I'm going to do now is take all of these pictures, flip them upside down. I'm going to tell you what I see. Okay. And then you can ask me a question based off of you can just pick whatever picture and whatever description that I give of each picture and say and ask me a question based off of what I said that I see. Okay. okay? All right, so since this one was already turned upside down, we'll start here. So here I see a black and white aerial view of the earth. And the original picture, which, well, your original picture was this one too, because <laughs> because that because you turned it upside down. I thought that was cool that you did that though. <laughs> um, so the next picture so let's say right here peter griffin <laughs> pregnant women the tropical trees so upside down upside down to me this looks like <laughs> yo so they gonna come take me away after i say this <laughs> it looks like two ducks in a straight jacket and they're wearing tims <laughs> now on their backs like oh, like on the backs of the ducks there are two gargoyles that look like they're dealing with the effects of a hangover like it looks like they are throwing up into uh, a crescent moon okay yeah, don't judge me man i hear you i hear it in your voice <laughs> i'm just trying to see everything you're saying I, I'm listening. I'm waiting for the third one, and then we'll go. Back. Yeah. Well, look, I'm judging me. So, um, all right. That's so it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the one where you said you saw the hippo coming out of water. So, <clears throat> right here, this looks like somebody going down on somebody else. Right in the middle, it looks like so. Okay, up at the top, those look like shoulders. And looks like right in the middle, their head is down, and the rest of that is their body. Now on the sides, it looks like the two legs that they're in between. Okay. And it looks like they're going down on somebody. Okay. All right. So which one of these pictures you want to use to ask me a question? All right. So I gotta 
So the, the first one was um, Earth. The second one was the Ducks in a Straight Jacket with the Moon. Uh -huh. And the third one is somebody going down on somebody. So the Earth. So uh -huh. I, I'll go back to, to the way that we, that we started our conversation. So I've done a handful of, of podcasts in, in the last couple of years, primarily uh, when I started the book, right? So a lot of people wanted to talk about that. Nobody really wanted to talk about real estate, uh, surprisingly. Everybody wanted to ask about the story, the life story. And I've been on some boring podcasts. Um, I've been on some that I've had fun on. And when I have fun, I say I have fun. And when I don't, I say, you know, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. This one is so unique. So I want to know how you got that, because you said you had like an aerial view. So it's like you're up looking down. Right. How you, because the rush is such a dope concept. I appreciate that. <laughs> is, do you feel like you know where you got that perspective? Or, or is it, do you realize that you have that? Ability? Yeah, I, I do. I do. It's a, um, so I've been into psychology for years. Um, I was, I've been in front of therapists. I think yesterday I finally counted how many therapists I've been in front of. Um, it was seven, seven different therapists. Um, unless I'm forgetting something, but I think it was only seven. Um, I've been on a psych ward. I have, um, you know, I think what happened was for me, there was a, there was a doctor one time who tried to psychoanalyze me based off of me looking at a magazine cover. It was a magazine. It was a National Geographic with Genghis Khan on the cover. And he tried to psychoanalyze me based off of me looking at this magazine. And I had no idea who Genghis Khan was at the time. I, it, but he just kept trying to connect me and Genghis Khan. And I'm like, dog, I have no idea who this is, you know? So that was the first thing that kind of got me interested in um, why they felt that they could uh, psychoanalyze someone based off of looking at a picture. Then the next time, um, it was a couple years later, I was in a class and the teacher had, um, you know, he pulled out the, which I believe is one of the most famous Rorschach tests where they say, if you see a butterfly, then you're a happy person. But if you see an explosion, then you're an angry person. So I, um, you know, everybody, he's asking everybody in the class, people are saying either butterfly explosion, butterfly explosion. He got to me. I said, I see an exploding butterfly. So the class laughed. He didn't laugh. He didn't think it was so funny, but I was making a point that life isn't so black and white that, you know, maybe today I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and yeah, I'm going to see an explosion, but maybe tomorrow everything went great. You know, I had a good breakfast. I'm happy. I ran into all of my friends and everything is just working well. My football team won yesterday, which by the way, did not happen. My team lost, but, um, you know, so now I wake up and I'm in a happy mood. So maybe today I see the butterfly, but my point was you can't just psychoanalyze somebody based off of look them looking at a picture without asking questions and peeling back layers, right? Me, my aerial view of the world, when I'm looking down, not even looking down like I'm looking down on people as if I'm better than them, but when I'm looking down and I'm looking at the world in totality, I see 7.5 billion people, 7.5 different personalities. Um, and so many different ways of doing things, of interacting, people connecting. I love meeting new people. I love uh, um, meeting new cultures, experiencing new cultures, the food, just everything, just all of the, the different things that come with the world. I love these things. But for me, psychology is always connected to it all. You know, I want to know what is it that caused you to say what you said or to do what you did? or to not do what you did or to not say what you said, you know? Um, and then this person was faced with the exact same situation, but they handled it completely different than you did. And that's the way these, these Rorschach tests work. You look at a picture and you see going back to, so me and you, we looked at the same thing right here. You see the stylized jack-o'-lantern of, uh, of a lion and I see 
a black and white aerial view of the earth. We're looking at the exact same thing and see two completely different things. And I think that that is one of the beauties of the world that we all don't think alike. That we can all look at this, look at the same thing and take away something completely different. And I, I think that that is, um, is, it's beautiful. I don't want to live in the world where everybody thinks the same. You know, then there's no reason for words like innovator, creator, surprise, amazing, great, wonderful. There's no need for these words because everything is the same and nothing and nobody stands out. You know, so that is that's my aerial view of the world. All of the innovators, all of the creators, all of the people who may not even be innovators and creators, but they are just as important to life and to the world as everybody else you know everybody having their spot and everybody looking at this thing called life and seeing it differently so i hope that answered your question <laughs> it, it, can't, it can't be an incorrect answer to your perspective on you <laughs> absolutely that's true <laughs> I, know, I know i think i think you're wrong uh so. <laughs> If you want to, I mean, I was about to wrap up, but if you want to ask me more I, questions, I, I, I just want to stick to the script, you know. What I'm <laughs> I know I'm a long winded too. I have a, I have a tendency to be the longest uh, interview. Is this the longest thing I've ever done? This is the longest. So I, I'm trying to I'm trying to learn how to um rein it in. Right. Well, you know what, man? I've had other interviews that have gone pretty long, and um, I'm like, man, I got to end this. I got to end this. I got to end this. This has been a little different for me. I try to stay right under an hour or like right up to an hour or whatever. I, ideally, I would love to be between 45 minutes and an hour. But there were so many gems. You know, we're at a time right now where people are desperate and sometimes desperation causes people to do things that they wouldn't normally do sometimes you know you I, I feel as though you know you you really see what a person is made of when either you take everything away from them or you give them everything that they've ever wanted <laughs> and then you really see what a person is made of there's so many people right now who are lacking and they don't have it all. So they may be moving a certain way and doing things out of desperation. But those same people could eventually get to a place where they have it all. So now you know how to, you need to know how to move and to maneuver after you get those things. I was not in a rush for this interview to end because there's so many gems for so many people. There's so many things that you said and the fact that you've been on both sides, you came from nothing. And now you're in a position where you have everything, but the reason that you have everything is because you're happy. Not because of the money, not because of the homes, not because of the things, the material things, because you're happy. And I want, I really wanted people to, to really pick up on, yes, there's a way to do this. There's a way to become successful, but focus on your happiness at the same time though. Right. So. Yeah, man, this has been, um, I feel like this right here is going to be very therapeutic. I think it's going to be a lesson, a lesson in business and a lesson in happiness. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and again, the perspective for me was dope because sometimes when you do something over and over and over, you know, it gets monotonous and it gets boring. Mm -hmm. And they, they were, that's one of the reasons why I feel like maybe a year or so I stopped even trying to do podcasts or talk to people because it's the same question. So, right. so it's say we, I might you know, like there's 35 <laughs> other you could just but and I understand it's a new audience and so you yeah. have to have that humility but on the inside you know it's 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 boring. So you had also totally novel questions and mm -hmm. so I and then I can't wait for it to come out so I can watch it because you know like I don't know if you get that like we we're doing this. So we don't get to go back and go, oh man, that did he say that? Oh, I, see. <laughs> I can't wait for it to drop so we can go back and, and take a look at it. Yeah, yeah, me too, man. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, 
All right, well, look, we're about to go ahead and wrap up. But before we do, I want you to just let everybody know where they can, you know, get in contact with you. And then all of your businesses, anything that you have going on, man, plug it all. Plug it all. And as you talk about the book, I'm going to put the cover up so that people can see that. I'm going to part of my success is learning how to refine things and how to streamline everything. So this is what we do. The easiest way to find every social media, the book, everything that I'm about, everything that I've done is just go to hahomesus.com. All the social media is at the bottom, all the links, everything is right there. You wanna Google me, just Google H.A. Homes US, everything, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, everything comes up. The, the fear book is on the website. Don't buy it off Amazon, don't buy it off a third party site, buy it from me. And here's the book. Everything is H.A. Homes US. I'll keep it simple for you. Follow us on Instagram, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Busy Money Cast coming soon. All right. Sound good. Um, and the, the the YouTube page is on there too, on the website. Everything is 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 youtube.com backslash mm -hmm. HA Homes US, TikTok, gotcha. HA Homes back. Everything is HA Homes US. So we're very okay. easy to find. Got you. Okay. So before we get out of here, I got one more picture for you, man. I want you to tell me exactly what it is that you see. <laughs> this podcast is so dope. I agree. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate everything that, that you're doing, man. You're making you're making a, a, a difference in a lot of people's lives because you're also an educator. You're teaching people how to become successful, but you're also um, teaching people that success and happiness is not rooted in money. Well, and, you. you know, now you're also telling them Go get your money. <laughs> Go get your money. But understand that that's not going to uh, bring you happiness. And I think that, that that should be the biggest lesson here today, man. So, you know, I, I just thank you so much for your time. I thank you for your humility. Uh, thank you for your transparency, just being so open and honest and frank about, you know, you growing up and and how it, you know, how you let how you got to this point, how it led you to this point. So and hey man, I, um, this this podcast, I'm gonna tell you something. I had high expectations for this interview, and you've definitely even exceeded those high expectations. So I appreciate you, man. <laughs> you too, brother. Likewise. All right, all right. And for the rest of you all, y'all be good to each other.